And now I would like to introduce Steve Zimmerman, the Slab on Ground Task Group Coordinator. Steve? Thanks, Maria. Today's webinar is the Art and Science of Slabs on Ground Repairs. It will be presented by Kip Gatto of Seattle and Darren Howard of Atlanta. This will be the final installment of a four-part webinar series sponsored by the Slab on Ground Task Group and the Concrete Structures TRG. Today's presentation will discuss repairs for common slab on ground distress conditions and provide suggestions for defining a scope of repair, detailing repairs, and selecting appropriate repair materials. Two case studies will also be explored, which help to showcase both the art and science of slab on ground repairs in a couple of situations. Kip will speak first, followed by Darren. Kip? Thanks, Steve, and thanks, Maria. Uh, and thanks everyone else for attending the webinar today. And as I mentioned, I'm Kip out of the Seattle office, and I'll be starting out uh, followed up by our colleague Darren Howard in Atlanta. So uh, first things first is to get control. Everybody's waiting patiently. That's okay, Kip. Maria, go ahead and uh, try clicking on one of the arrow keys. Out. There you go. There we go. All right. Thanks for everyone's patience. Well, we, of course, need to start out with our learning objectives today for the AIA course. And there are four learning objectives, which I'll just list here and let everybody uh, read and absorb those for a moment. So hopefully by the end, we'll be able to do all these four things. And so I'll start off the webinar by a brief discussion of the basics. Now this is part four in the four-part series, so a lot of the details of the design and evaluation of slabs on ground have already been taken care of. But I still think it's worth a little primer on this. And uh, you know, concrete slabs on ground are pretty simple. It's just a relatively rigid concrete slab continuously supported by a relatively soft soil subgrade. Sometimes they'll add reinforcement in there for shrinkage and crack control. Uh, it's typically not intended for strength or spanning ability, and uh, sometimes it's not even used at all. <coughs> so we'll start off with some con typical conditions. So I'll share all the very common conditions that we typically run into. And we'll go through all those. And since there's a lot of overlap in those conditions, I'll, I'll present them all, and then we'll follow up with that with uh, common repairs to address those conditions. And those conditions are cracks, which are we're all familiar with, uh, edge raveling, which is kind of associated with cracks, voiding below the slab, spalls in the slab, uh, situations where we may need to do slab replacement. And then I have this cornucopia term here because a lot of, there's a lot of overlap between Typically, our repairs involve several of them. And then at that point, I'll turn it over to Darren, who will talk about a couple of case studies. His are going to be a lot, little more unique conditions, so I'm going to present some common ones, and he's going to present some unique ones in the context of these case, case studies. So typical conditions, and as I mentioned, we'll start off with cracks. And well, we're familiar with cracks. Uh, cracks are commonly caused by these phenomena shown here. Uh, restrained movement is a common one where we have uh, shrinkage of thermal movements that are restrained, causing stresses that are associated with cracks. We have impact and fatigue, which uh, most people think of in the context of steel, yet concrete does experience this phenomenon as well. We have joints, which are installed on purpose, which are essentially cracks, except for controlling the location where we occur. We have settlement and curling that can cause cracking. Uh, and then we have these bottom two items, which I'm not going to get into because they don't occur so much in slab on ground construction. Uh, structural conditions are a concern, but they're more, more common in the context of impact and fatigue rather than a simple static overload. And because the slabs we're talking about are generally industrial slabs or box store slabs or, or warehouse slabs that are in an indoor environment, meaning we're not going to talk a lot about roadway pavements and that kind of thing today. Uh, corrosion, re corrosion of reinforcement is typically not an issue. There's not a lot of access to moisture, and as I mentioned earlier, there's not even a lot of reinforcement in these slabs. So shrinkage cracks are the most common type of condition that we see, and uh, we're familiar with this. We have concrete shrinks as it cures. If you have 
some element that's going to be impediment to accommodating that shrinkage, which we call restraint, you're going to get stresses build up, which is going to cause a crack. And associated with cracking is a condition called raveling. Uh, if you have forklift traffic or product or industrial processes that are going over the top of a crack, you're going to induce uh, impact uh, uh, loads at the edge of that crack because it's got a little bit of imperfection or undulation to it. And, you, and that is also going to be associated with a reduced shear capacity at the edge of that crack because you have a lack of confinement. And as many of us know, shear capacity is improved by confinement. So eventually what happens is, is the edge of our crack tend to break off, and we call that condition raveling. And we also have fatigue conditions which can occur. Uh, as I mentioned, the slabs on ground rely heavily on subgrade support for their strength and serviceability. And if that subgrade is a little bit soft, uh, as the forklifts drive over it, they can tend to deflect it down a little bit. It's a little exaggerated in this picture, but you get the idea. And that's going to happen over and over and over and over again over the life of the facility. And eventually, uh, you're going to get some cracking associated with fatigue of, uh, associated with having that phenomenon occur over and over again. Then we also have voiding. Uh, voiding is where the subgrade is pulled away from the bottom of the slab. There's a couple of ways this can occur. First of all, the, slab can, the soil can simply settle a little bit below the slab. Maybe you had a bad area of soil or something and it settled a little bit. But what I find to be much more common is this curling phenomenon where uh, the bottom of the slab is, is uh, a little bit moister than the top, so the top tends to dry faster, which results in a more accelerated and a greater degree of shrinkage strain. And the result is the slab tends to want to kind of dish upward, as shown in this picture. It's usually not as dramatic as in this picture, but nonetheless, it's what happens. And as the forklifts drive over it, as I mentioned, there's not a lot of spanning ability in these slabs. So over time, or even sometimes right away, that edge of that slab can break off. And uh, either it's kind of dramatic, as shown in this picture, but oftentimes it's a lot more subtle, and we'll get some cracking or spalling at the location of that break. And so here's an example of a typical industrial slab. They store heavy stone, stone slabs, <laughs> different kind of slab, uh, in this facility, and they carry them around with forklifts. So you can imagine we get a lot of demand. We have a lot of our typical conditions here. So of course we have the joints, which are essentially just cracks, except for choosing where they occur. We have this kind of circular cracking area, which I commonly, uh, which is commonly associated with voiding. This is kind of what it looks like when you have a little bit of undermining at a location. Even if it's minor, you'll tend to get this uh, circular profile. And then you also get shrinkage cracking uh, or fatigue cracking. And uh, if left untreated over a long time, you'll also get some raveling. I'll just go through some examples. Here's another condition where we have some cracking. We, of course, have our joint uh, where we control the cracking. And then we have this uh, unintentional cracking. And over time, we'll get some raveling. And as that raveling goes untreated and gets worse, that uh, the, the pieces that break off tend to crumble or otherwise go away. And eventually, we get to a point where we define it as a spall. And our repair will change a little bit. And whenever I see this sort of uh, condition where it looks like it kind of broke off near a joint, as I was showing in that animation, uh, it's indicative of where you might have some voiding or curling condition there as well. And here's another example of a joint. It's simply just sim it's been, been poorly treated or untreated over time, so it, it tends to ravel and deteriorate over time, and eventually it gets uh, wide enough where we might characterize it as a spall. And also in here is what I, what I call goof, because it's this, uh, in a lot of these situations, before WJE got involved, somebody just simply come in and pour some material in and attempt to repair. Without it being well thought out, it really doesn't achieve much except some, potentially some short-term aesthetic appeal. But really, you're not achieving much beyond that if you don't do it properly. And you can see they just poured the material in there. Here's another example. This is obviously a, a slab that's been used for quite some time. We have some cracking that's probably started off as shrinkage cracking, and over time it's deteriorating. Uh, we also have a joint, which essentially is the same thing as a crack. From a repair serviceability perspective, there's no reason to treat it any different. Sometimes I'll get owners say, just fix the cracks and not the joints, but it's, that is an indication to me, to me that they really don't even know what they're trying to achieve. 
And of course, we'll also get some raveling at some point along this, and eventually that'll turn into some spalling. Here's another example. Uh, we have some cracking. Again, at, over time, you can see we have some deteriorated locations there where it's turning into spalling, or we have this little island here. I actually don't know if that's uh, going to break off. More than likely, that's connected. Those two cracks are connected, and that's actually a spall or delamination location uh, adjacent to the crack. And of course, we have to have our pointless coop that somebody put in there at some point. Here's another example of a crack. This is a location, this is a, a crack that was due to settlement. That's, that's why it's, it's probably a little more dramatic than we're customarily used to seeing. We also have some raveling at this location. Here's an example where we had some relative settlement. So this column is on a square footing and it's settled relative to the slab on ground that surrounds it, make, making it lower than the slab, an abrupt transition there. Again, somebody tried to pour some goop in there as a poor attempt at a repair that didn't last too long. You can see the deterioration we have around the edge, and a lot of that goop is debonded. Here's an example of some deteriorated joints where they laid a metal strip in the joint and uh, it's left untreated for too much longer. Uh, it's gonna, some of these so-called joint repairs are going to turn into spa repairs. Another example of a deteriorated joint uh, is turning into some spalling, and of course the obligatory goop uh, that point apparently put in there so somebody say they can did a repair, but it really didn't achieve too much. And another example, got your joint that's turning into a spall, and then of course your goop. And here's a condition where we have some fairly extensive crack cracking, and it often becomes difficult to decide what to do. Do we replace this whole area of slab? That may be the appropriate solution. It's probably going to be the most durable repair. Or do we simply try to fix all these cracks? It's really where the art comes into this situation. You know, that's why we call it the art in the science. It depends a lot on what the tenant is trying to achieve, how durable your repair needs to be, how important it is to not interrupt the uh, the facility, as you can imagine, if you're going to replace this area of slab, uh, that you know you have to demo it and pre prepare the soil and put reinforcement in and treat the edges, and you know that can be fairly time-consuming. So there's often a lot of resistance to that. So there's no one solid answer. I'm just showing you these uh, some examples of situations where really this is an art as well as a science in deciding what to do and deciding the most appropriate repair. And it's really where WJE's expertise and value can be really beneficial to the client in helping them establish the best solution. And here's an example. Again, I, I like to show these where uh, repairs have been tried in the past and the left uh, uh, loading dock area with a lot of traffic. Uh, they had to do repeated repairs there about once every three months. When I was there documenting the conditions, the tenant said, hey, you know, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm designing repair for this situation. And their comment was essentially, well, good luck with that. Uh, that you know, they do repairs for this all the time. They just don't last. It's too heavy demand. And really, that's because somebody's coming in and maybe pouring some goop or maybe goop plus, but really not giving this the attention that it needs. And so we ended up doing the repair on the right. I'll talk a little bit more about slab repairs later. But, you know, durable repairs can be achieved. And that repair has been there a couple of years in that picture, and there's really no problems. And uh, just a matter of tailoring your repair is appropriate to the situation. Here's an example where we had some uh, the slab was underlain by a foam, so it, you know it, it turns out that you can actually use foam as a rigid subgrade in some situations, but you may have to use the right foam. This was not the right foam. This is a really poor quality foam, so we had some settlement deterioration. And in this case, not much other option but to replace this area of slab. So sometimes slab replacement is needed. And with that, I kind of, like I mentioned, I wanted to start out with the conditions, and I'll move into some common repairs to address those conditions. And we'll start off with just coming, talking about some key aspects of performing success, successful repairs. A lot of these apply to a lot of the things that we do at Wish Channing, and it's really no different in this case. Um, but I'll go through them briefly nonetheless. So we'll start off, obviously we need to do a case-specific evaluation and demand assessment. And you know, what I really mean by that is that, you know, do we have a, a warehouse or industrial slab with heavy loading and impact from forklifts and a lot of, a lot of traffic and a lot of storage and materials? 
Or is this a sidewalk, sidewalk or a concourse with some light duty foot traffic and uh, not really much in the way of demand? It's really going to factor into what the repair we eventually decide to do. That, that heavily cracked uh, photo I showed you earlier, uh, you know, that's a, that this definitely plays into that decision of whether you replace that slab. If it's just going to be exposed to foot traffic, you may just live with the cracking and do nothing. So these case-specific evaluations are important. Obviously, these are occupied facilities a lot of times with industrial processes, so client coordination is important. And along that, along those lines, uh, we all know to avoid shortcuts in almost everything we do. Usually, there's a there's a compromise to be done there. And the pressure for shortcuts comes from cost, but it also comes from speed. A lot of times in these situations, the, the tenants want you out of there. They don't want you interrupting what they're doing with repairs and. A lot of times it's very difficult, but also very important to remain diligent and keep the best repairs going because uh, obviously that's going to improve the long-term performance and that's the way you need to explain it to the owner. It's just hang in there, it's worth it, give us a couple days to do this right, you, know, you won't have to mess with it again for 10 years. Similarly uh, to the case-specific evaluation, assess what you're trying to achieve. Do you need a long-term durable repair? Sometimes, you know, you know, the tenant is going to be moving out in a year and you just need something to get you by for a year. Or sometimes the client doesn't want to mess with this uh, again at all for a decade. And so that's, you know, important in the decision-making process. And a lot of these other conditions are similar, are typical of everything we do. Trial repairs and mock-ups are, of course, critical. Surface preparation is, of course, critical. Not only the surface of the concrete, but if you're doing a replacement, the surface of the soil needs to be prepared. You need really good compaction, very critical in slab on ground designs. If you don't have a properly compacted soil subgrade, everything over the, you do over the top of it isn't going to matter too much. Using the appropriate tools to make sure it's done right, and not forgetting that this is an art and a science. So really what that means is it relies on our experience as much as our technical know-how. And so if you don't have a lot of experience in these these designs, there's people in WGA that do, and it's important to consult with them because uh, that's just as important as the science of it. And of course, quality control goes without saying. So I'll start off with typical repairs for cracks and joints. Uh, this is the common process that we use. You can see it's pretty simple. You simply cut a fairly deep groove into the crack. Uh, sometimes you'll plug it with some sand or other material at the bottom to prevent your repair, excuse me, repair material from running down into the crack. And then you overfill it with the repair material and then you shave it nice and smooth and flush with the top of the concrete surface. And the reason we do the repairs this way is twofold. One is, uh, is to protect the edges of that crack or joint from impact because impact loads are a lot greater than what are essentially static loads if you just get a wheel moving over the top without the impact nature of it. And it also tends to confine the size of that cracker joint. So you can improve the shear strength of the edge. So not only do you basically reduce the load of demand, but you can also increase the capacity by providing the adequate confinement. And the material that we use for these repairs is typically a semi-rigid material. So it's basically not a really soft material like a sealant, but not a really hard material like a concrete, but something in the middle. And the reason we, we want the something in the middle is we want it to be it's more on the rigid side because we want it to be rigid enough to protect the, the joint or the crack against the forklift or other impacts that may occur. We want it to be strong enough to provide the confinement we're trying to achieve. We also have to recognize that there's going to be a little bit of movement at that crack and if we put a perfectly rigid material in there, it's probably going to not be able to accommodate that movement and it's going to deteriorate. And so we use the semi-rigid materials, and these materials are typically e either an epoxy or a polyurea. I'm not a chemist, but these are some sort of fancy polymers, typically a two-part material. And here's an example of a guy doing some detail uh, cutting of a, of a crack with a, with a grinder with a diamond blade grinding wheel. If you're going to do more production-oriented processes, you use equipment like this where you have a push-behind dry saw cut machine with a vacuum assembly attached to capture most of the dust and the debris. This is great if you have a lot of cracks and joints you're preparing and you need a lot of production. And if you're in an occupied facility where you've got to keep the dust down, really effective piece of equipment. And uh, the next slide is an example of that. Here we go. You, you can see that you can go around corners with this and you can get a really nice clean saw cut out of there. If you use the right equipment, 
if you use the wrong equipment, it will be a disaster. But if you get the right equipment, you can you can get some fairly decent uh, saw cuts without a lot of overcut and get the depth that you desire. As I mentioned, putting a little sand in the bottom was beneficial to keep preventing the material from running down into the joint or the crack. And of course, quality control is important. Usually what I do in these situations is specify the saw cut to be about an inch deep. Uh, what I find in the field is that gets me typically anywhere from three quarters of an inch to an inch. And it works out pretty nice because if it's less than three quarters of an inch, uh, the contractor tends to not push back too much uh, if I uh, call them out to cut it deeper. And if it's greater than three quarters of an inch, I, in our experience, we tend to get really good performance. Well, here's an example of the guy filling it up with the semi-rigid material. And as I mentioned, you want to overfill it so you can get a nice clean surface with the top once you shave it off. If you don't use the sand, sometimes the material will want to fall back down in there and run down into the crack. Or sometimes this happens, you know, actually frequently this happens even if you do use the sand. So you'll need to top it off with some more material or you can come back the next day and add material. When I go around warehouses and you know, big box stores like Home Depot or Walmart or stuff, I often see this condition where the material ran down low and they didn't get it nice and flush. And this is an example of the guy shaving it off. Really nice, clean surface when you're when he's done. You can see there. And again, in addition to, to grinding the top of the surface off, though, if you use the epoxy, this doesn't work with the polyurea, but if you use the epoxy, you can heat the material, the overfilled material up, kind of warm or basically hot without melting it with a torch. And then if you use a really sharp razor blade, you can slice it off really nice and clean with the surface. So this is this is a. A, a nice method. Obviously, it doesn't create a lot of dust and debris from the grinding. Uh, you can get the nice, clean top surface that you're looking for. It actually goes pretty quickly as well on top of it. And, you know, this next photo here we go is another example of it being applied at a joint. You can see that it slices off real nicely. It does tend to leave a little staining on that outside edge, so if that's an aesthetic issue, most of the jobs I work on, they don't care at all what it looks like. But uh, if they do, you can apply some tape there to keep that staining from occurring. You're always going to see the repair material. There's not a lot you can do about that, but you can certainly mitigate that staining. So that's the crack and joint repair. Uh, now I'm going to move on to voiding repair, which is uh, what I call slab stable, what a lot of us call slab stabilization. So what do you do when you have this condition? Well, it's, it's, it's pretty simple. You, you drill some holes in the slab and fill it up with material. And you got to make sure you get enough material in there that it actually gets good coverage and fills it up. But uh, if you do this, uh, it's been a tried and true method, very effective. Uh, the materials that we use for it, used to use a lot of Portland cement grouts. So you simply use a sand uh, Portland cement mix and pump that in there. But nowadays, I hardly ever see that anymore. It's much more common to see a polyurea or a polyurethane foam pumped in there. And this is another condition I wanted to talk about briefly. Uh, often associated with voiding, like when that column settled relative to the slab around it, or when you have the curling phenomena that we discussed earlier, uh, you'll get a little bit of what we call lippage at the end, which is a rough transition at, the, at a joint or crack or other transition in a slab. So uh, associated with the repairs in this context, I'll typically have them grind that lip off, and you want to grind it out far enough to create a a shallow transition to the different elevations of the slab. And so here's an example of some guys pumping in. The, uh, in this case, it's a polyurea uh, filler material. And here's a guy with a pump. Uh, it's a low pressure injection pump. He's got two part material. You can see he's got the A and the B there. And here's the guy, again, pumping it in. Uh, you can see that they drill ports in the slab and pump it in. And it's it's kind of like crack injection. You, you pump it in until it comes out the next hole. And once it comes out the next hole, you plug that hole that you're pumping in. You can see we have some other repairs associated with this going on as well. Here's another example of it. You can see we have some spall repairs being prepared in the process. We'll talk about spalls after this, but uh, you can see them pumping it in. Really effective, actually. 
And so the way that we identify these areas that need to have stabilization is if you have forklift traffic, you have a forklift driver on the building, you simply just look at these cracks and joints and you can see them moving up and down as the forklift drives over it. And having a very static, stable slab is really important to repair. It's probably the most important thing. So uh, see, really, even if it's just a tiny bit, you can imagine even if this joint was just moving a tiny bit, uh, that that would deteriorate over time. So it's really important to get them stable. And then, of course, when we're done with the repair, as a quality control measure, we have the forklift drive back over the top and make sure we've actually achieved the stabilization that we were intending. Here's that column that I showed you earlier that they poured the goop on to try to level it out. A much better method is simply just grind the surface flush and carry it out far enough that they have a very shallow transition to the different elevations. Uh, that way you don't have to worry about trying to bond some thin material. And you can see, of course, at the joint there, there's also some repairs that are in progress associated with that. And so as I mentioned, we're going to move into spall repair now. Uh, as you can see in this slide, I don't expect you to read all the, the detailed language, but the slide shows you know, uh, a small spall, uh, adding some mechanical anchorage, and then simply pouring back a repair material. You can see we put these in an angle, because one of the unique things about slab repairs is the spalls tend to be very small. They, they're generally an area that used to be a joint or a crack, as I was showing you some, in some of those earlier photos. And they sort of morph themselves into a, a spall situation. So it's difficult to get a lot of mechanical anchorage in there. In this case, we're able to get a little bit. And then if it's over a joint, we recut the joint. Uh, sometimes we simply, if it's small enough, we just simply omit the mechanical anchorage. So we use a rigid material that can act as essentially repair concrete. And we do a nice square cut, but if you have a really small area, there's really no way to mechanically anchor it. But if you have a nice square cut and it's a small area, in our experience, it tends to perform very well. And as before, if you have a joint there, you need to recut that joint. So what kind of materials do we use for that? Well, if it's a big spall, and those do happen, then of course, it's just like all the other concrete patch where you work, we do, or, or some form of Portland cement concrete is the way to go. But most of the times we use these really small spalls, or at least uh, in section they're small, and uh, we want to use a fancier material, and that's typically a polymer modified cement mortar, or even sometimes it's a pure polymer, like a urethane or something like that, and they can formulate those to be, to be very rigid uh, and, and an effective repair material in that context. Here's an example of that. This is a surface that's been prepped. You can see the nice square edges and the roughened surface of the interior. Here's some of that fancy repair material being troweled in there. And at the end, we have a, a, you know, a really nice effective repair. You can see that uh, there's a joint there that we'll need to recut, but uh, otherwise a good repair. Here's another example of that repair being performed at a joint. You know, as the spall grew out a little bit, we just increased our saw cut around the edge a little bit. Here's another example of that. This kind of shows you how small these can be. It would be tough to mechanically anchor this, but because we have that nice square trench there, there's really not much opportunity for that material to fall out. And you can get a good bond there and effective repair. You can also see the little port over to the right there. Yeah, so that, that's, that's where we're going to uh, inject the subgrade below with the slab stabilization material. Oftentimes, they just go to, those go together. And not surprisingly, where we have a slab that's moving a lot, we're going to have some deterioration. Getting that slab nice and static is what we're trying to achieve. So bringing it all together, so a typical approach. You know, the first thing is what we do is we typically identify the places that need to be stabilized, stabilized and apply the, the fill material. And then we do our spa repairs. And oftentimes, we want to do some grinding to grind it smooth. And the next thing you know, we have a really nice, durable, stable slab that uh, is actually also reasonably flat for traffic that's going over the top of it. It's probably important to note that what I mean by durable isn't 50 years durable, because these things, in a lot of cases, get a lot of heavy abuse. So even five years would be a, would be a good outcome in most of these contexts. And that goop that's poured in there, you know, I see them coming back and pouring that back in every, like, literally every couple months for years. They'll do that. I, I, I don't, uh, it, it's certainly an area where WJ can add value and, I, and something that I run into a lot where I uh, don't understand why they're willing to keep doing that and, but not perform the durable repair. There's always resistance, but 
certainly there's opportunities for WGA to provide value in these situations, and uh, we can get repairs that can give them years of service. And here's some examples of that. So you can see we have some spall repairs here where some joints are coming together. It's another example of that. So you can see we have the spall repair material, and the, that material is where we've recut the joint. Uh, outside of that area where we see we haven't recut the joint, we have the semi-rigid material. So this is where the arc kind of comes in. Where does it turn from a crack or a joint repair into a spall repair? And that's just where uh, the experience and the limitations of these materials comes into play in making those decisions, and uh, you know that's that's really the art part of it as well as the science part of it. You know, here's another example where we have some spalls and cracks, and they've been uh, the joints have been recut. Here's another example of as well where we have some spalls and cracks and joints, and uh, we've repaired them all. We've recut some of the joints, and at the end of the day, we have uh, a nice. A reasonably durable surface that should have some relatively long longevity. You can see that we've also uh, addressed some of the the uh, slab stabilization with the, the ports there. So with that, uh, I'll mention that we do need to do slab replacement sometime. And previous webinars have talked a lot about slab design. So if you do slab replacement, you can simply follow slab design and design it. It's really that simple. I only want to point out a couple important details. One is the new to existing and new to, uh, new to new joints that are going to be created in your slab, and those need to be treated differently. The materials we use are simply Portland cement concrete and reinforcement, not surprising there. Uh, and here's an example of the new to existing slab edge. So we have, at this location, we have a square dowel with a rectangular slip sleeve that goes over the top. And what this does is it allows movement in the horizontal plane so when that new slab shrinks, and the existing slab, of course, isn't going to sh have those shrinkage strains, it doesn't create a lot of shrinkage stress because we are allowed the movement in the horizontal plane, but it doesn't allow movement in the vertical plane. And of course, we also need to reinforce the slab, which you can uh, be based on previous webinars. And here's a new to new slab joint. Obviously, we're not going to get relative differential and shrinkage strain, so we can just use these round dowel baskets. It allows the slab to move away from the joint provides relief there, but in no other direction. Here's another example of a, a, a slab repair. And I'm showing this slide just to show you all the dobies that we put there. I always like to have them add a lot of dobies. Almost no matter what, I'm having them add more, because they're going to step on it during placement. And we're, where we want the rebar is up high in the slab. So a lot of dobies can be really helpful in that regard. With that, I'm going to move on to some uh, closing things out with some things to consider uh, when it comes to slab repairs. and just some basic uh, various things that I've learned all the years and over the years. And one of those is this coordination. Of, of course, we all know that we need to coordinate most of our jobs with the owners or the tenants. Uh, but in these kind of situations, it becomes really critical. This is an interesting little booth that the contractor built. All of the grinding and surface prep is going on inside of that booth. And it's a mobile booth, so they can move it around the facility and do all their prep uh, without creating a lot of dust or disruption to the facility. As I mentioned earlier, the art part of this, where, you, where do you stop? Sometimes I might replace this area of slab, and sometimes I might fix all these cracks. It really depends on the context of the situation. Is it going to get a lot of high demand? Uh, do we just simply not have an opportunity to wait? And so that, you know, that's something that we run into, and those are decisions that need to be made on a case-by-case -case basis. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, morphing repairs. When is it a crack? When is it a spall? And how do we decide? Uh, when to make those transitions. Uh, this next slide here uh, is uh, something that these are repairs were joint repairs that actually I designed probably 12 years ago. One of the things that we didn't do was do the slab stabilization. So all the repair, although the repairs are still there and they're kind of helping, uh, in hindsight I think some slab stabilization was merited. This is kind of what can happen. Those, those joints and edges will just simply deteriorate due to the rocking and the movement. We really need our slabs to be static, so lesson learned there. And again, this is a situation, not only was there not slab stabilization, this isn't my repair, but not slab stabilization done, but this is where the semi-rigid material was applied too wide, too big, and it's beyond the, beyond the useful purpose of this material. So the material is dishing down and becoming debonded, 
And so again, part of the art of it, when to switch materials and turn their joints into a spall repair and so forth. Here's that same facility that I showed you two slides ago, and this is a crack repair in that facility where we didn't get a lot of movement, and these cracks are really performing great. They look just like they did 12 years ago, almost no problem. So it just goes to show you how important it is that stabilization aspect of the repairs can be. And then finally, I'd like to close out. As I mentioned, we use uh, two polymers are commonly used for the crack and joint repairs. One is an epoxy and one is a polyurea. This is a polyurea, and in, in my experience, it's just simply not quite as good. The reason I bring this up is it's heavily pushed, uh, and it's what's used probably 90% of the time in the country, and actually quite frequently by a wish Um uh, because it cures so much faster, so you can do it quicker and be in and out, and the repairs go faster. But uh, with the mock-ups I've done, it just simply doesn't perform as well. It's harder to grind flush with the surface. It's not as tough. We got these little air voids in it. It didn't bond as well, in this case, to the edge of the surface. So uh, just keep that in mind, that polyurea can work, but it's not as good as epoxy. So when you get it as a substitute in your job, remember that you're making a compromise when you use this material. And so I think that's about it for my part, and I'll uh, turn the presentation over to our esteemed colleague, Mr. Darren Howard Esquire in the Atlanta office. Thanks, Kip, for that very nice introduction. Um, we're going to look at two case studies that I worked on where we actually did slab replacements. The first one uh, is a freezer slab, which was a little bit unique uh, project. And the bullet point on here actually has, shows that we were contacted to evaluate heating of the, of the freezer slab itself. It was three years old, but actually the first thing that, that prompted our involvement was they were worried about the freezer enclosure itself. Um, the racks that you can see in this photo were actually uh, rotating outward and imparting load uh, horizontally on the freezer walls, and they were concerned that the freezer itself could come down. And this had gone on for a long time, and no one really express much concern in the, the slab itself. And in this photo, you can see some of the way the racks that were anchored to the slab are rotating and pushing those freezer walls out, which this is a good example of how perhaps little attention sometimes the slabs can take um, you know, before something really becomes a concern. The, the freezer slab itself was about uh, 2,100 square feet. And these red boxes in this photo illustrate some of the inspection openings we made, and obviously the crack through the a really large fault line kind of down the middle of it. I won't spend too much time on the cause of the failure, but we, I will show some photos. Um, there are a photo on the left there. You can see kind of that fault line. And the photo on the right, there was a, this is probably the worst area of it, the maximum, but there was about two and a quarter inches of vertical faulting across that down the center of the freezer slab that was causing the slab to be sloped on either side and causing that rotation of the rack. Beneath the slab, they had a vapor retarder that was polyethylene sheeting and a two-inch layer of sand. And in that layer of sand, you had these massive ice lenses that had formed beneath the insulation and were heat causing the heaving of the freezer slab itself. The, the cause for the heaving um, was related to these gaps primarily between the insulation boards that were in some areas up to two inches. So they had eight inch thick insulation boards, but they weren't tight. The concrete, when they placed the freezer slab, was allowed to flow between the joints and basically conduct those freezing temperatures down to the subgrade. Um, ACI 360 talked a little bit in it about freezer slabs and kind of the three conditions that need to occur to cause frost heave beneath slabs. Those would be obviously freezing temperatures some form of water, be it groundwater or water from some other source, and then what they call frost susceptible soil, such as like a silt or a clay or, or a sand in the instance that we have. Some type of soil that if it has moisture in it that freezes, it will volumetrically increase because um, it has nowhere else to expand other than up or down. So obviously the approach that we took in this was the, the heaving was so bad that you know, obviously the slab needed to be replaced. We were working kind of in this confined 
isolated freezer area. And so we, you know, it has somewhat of an irregular shape. And the photo on the left here shows the control joint layout that we illustrated on our, our, our drawings to basically tell the contractor how we want the panels laid out, the aspect ratio that we wanted. We tried to keep between one and a half to one ratio or lower. Um, the photo on the right shows the insulation layout for the boards we used, um, which was a total thickness of eight inches, but we used two layers of four inch uh, insulation boards that had the edges taped. Um, we had a requirement that we wanted the boards to tightly abut one another, and then that we wanted them staggered. So basically, eliminating any possibility that you could have a, a lining joint that concrete could flow down into to basically recreate the problem that, that caused the issue in the first place. This photo goes from a drawing that kind of just shows the typical section of our well, five-inch slab that we had, the two layers of the insulation board. I know it was presented in part one of the slab series that um, in ACI 360 talks about this also as far as when to use a vapor retarder or when not. In this instance, we did use one um, due to the fact that we wanted to prevent any possibility or limit vapor drive that, that was in the subgrade from coming up into the freezer slab itself. So this instance, um, we did use a vapor retarder, whereas in other scenarios, if you're not having a moisture-sensitive flooring system installed, you would want to not have that. The red dash line in this photo shows kind of where the two-inch layer of sand that previously existed stopped. As part of our repair, we wanted to remove that also. So the approach we took here was to try to eliminate two of the three conditions for sure that caused the frost even in the first place. That would be we want to limit the ability for freezing temperatures to get to the soil. We wanted to remove the sand frost susceptible soil and go back with a four inch layer of uh, gravel. Along the perimeter of the freezer slab, there was existing uh, double two by 12 blocking. Um, and we had our vapor retarder turn up on that and to be taped along the edge. Um, this detail here just shows that section that we included in our drawing. As Kip mentioned in his part, the tenant accommodation is a big part of these, and I'm sure people are used to that in our line of work. As much as we have to deal with functioning existing facilities, they had to do the work at night, and you know this is in a retail store. Um, I believe it was the BJ's Wholesale Clubhouse, kind of like a Sam's Club. Uh, but they had to filter you know, all the air, the dust, the debris. Uh, they had to cart everything out by hand through the store at night. So it was a pretty difficult work environment, a lot of considerations to, to keep the store obviously functioning during this work. These photos just illustrate our vapor retarder being placed. And then obviously on the right, the, the layout of the insulation boards. It did change a little bit during the construction. They, uh, had more easily available, they could get, um, instead of four by eight boards, they used two by eight wide boards, basically, which still just, still worked fine. It was just a di different configuration, but that's why in the photo it looks like they're smaller. This photo here shows the freezer uh, slab after it was placed. Uh, I think in this instance they're beginning to do the freezer drawdown, so they had to draw the freezer temperature down over a certain period um, to kind of ramp up the freezing temperatures. And so one of the things that we did in our case, um, and maybe I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but we, we illustrated our control joint placement on our drawings. And one of the things that when we went out to inspect it is that frequently they stopped the control joints very short of the slab edge at the perimeter. And the reason for that was they had their large saw cut but it could only cut you know, up to the edge about, about five to six inches to the perimeter. And so one of the things we had them do was extend that with a smaller saw. And that's a frequent occurrence in my experience is that you know, they want to just come out and cut it, but then they don't do that, that last little bit. And if you don't extend it, then obviously a crack will want to form there. What I was mentioning before about the freezer drawdown, in our instance for the joint filler, we did use a polyurea. And the reason for that was um, polyurea is the one, I would say, benefit or situation where you might want to consider using it is, it, is it an instance where you have freezing or 
lower installation temperatures. In this instance, they were beginning to do the freezer drawdown for the, for the freezer itself to the freezing temperatures. And had we used an epoxy prior to that, my concern was that the slab itself was going to shrink as it was exposed to the freezing temperatures and would shrink away. And the epoxies don't have the lower installation temperatures that polyureas do. In this instance, um, we did not have issues with the polyureas, um, but I'll talk a little bit later on about an instance where we did. And then here is a photo just once it was kind of all completed and wrapped up. For, uh, this project is some of the products we used. The vapor retarder was the Sago wrap. There's a 15 mil. Um, I believe within ACI 360 they recommend if you're going to have a vapor retarder it be 10 mil or greater. Uh, so we used the Sago wrap product. We use that quite frequently here. Uh, the insulation was a Dow product, and the joint filler, as I mentioned, was a polyurea by Metzger McGuire. The second case study is the receiving area slab that it actually was in Kentucky. And our involvement began um, due to a continued nuisance the store is having with a crumbling or dusting of the slab in that area that was causing a significant nuisance for the store. Uh, they frequently were reporting dust on boxes, on merchandise that was being kicked up or spread everywhere in the area where they had to work. For this project, our initial approach, um, and given that when we were going all the way to Kentucky to look at it, was the initial thought was, well, perhaps we can do something to try to save the slab or, or look at the just the existing slab surface to see if there's something that can be done. And we uh, took cores while we were there and it involved the JTC to have those looked at. Um, the photos here show some of the kind of scaling or deterioration of that top surface that was existing in the slab. In the photo on the left, you can see in that darker region, there were a number of previous coatings that the store had tried to apply to the surface to try and seal that. And those were failing in many areas. So as, as Kit mentioned, with his examples of goop, I'm not, this was maybe a coating that was goop, but in the cores that we sent to the lab and the ones that had the coating, they estimated that there were perhaps six to ten layers of this coating that had been installed and was just continuing to fail. Um, some of the photography done by the JTC of the cores, they found there was a very weak layer in the top eighth inch. Um, they attributed this to primarily bleed water channels or, and air that was trapped beneath the surface. The photo on the right illustrates uh, one of those channels in the core. In addition, they had found micro-cracking in the cores down probably in about the, the top inch, top seven-eighths of an inch. In addition, we found that the core thickness of the slab varied from three and a quarter to four and a quarter, four and a quarter inches. This photo from one of the cores shows the coating where it had failed as well as some of the areas of uh, the void and the trapped lead water beneath the surface. And this photo shows one of the micro cracks. From, and also, you can see some of the air voids as well uh, in the top surface of the concrete. Um, after learning that and talking with the client, um, and given the variation of slab thickness, we concluded that it was the best option was to simply remove and replace this slab rather than try and uh, do surface prep to remove that layer and then perhaps be left with only uh, two to three inches of good slab left, um, it would be found that it was simpler and more economical to simply remove and replace it. So the drawings we prepared um, outlined the areas of the receiving area slab that, that were going to be replaced. And the, this figure from our drawings, uh, the blue box illustrates a very large box compactor. The red boxes illustrate columns for a small mezzanine or office area they had added after the fact in the receiving area, and then the green indicates the stair to access that. Those are all existing elements that we had to work around. In addition, um, just to accommodate the continuing function of the store, they had separate receiving area storage, off, not off-site, but outside in the loading area set up, and so that we could complete the 
replacing the slab in two phases. This red box here illustrates the, the first phase, and this smaller box here illustrates the second phase. What I'm trying to illustrate here were those existing elements. Um, and around those existing elements, we decided to leave portions of the existing slab. Most of the deterioration of the slab was occurring, obviously, in areas of high traffic or in aisles. And so there wasn't much deterioration of that top surface around these existing elements. So it's simpler, simpler to leave them rather than try and remove them or obviously shore the mezzanine in those areas. And so we left those portions of the slab in place. In the large area, the receiving area slab, this is the control joint layout that we illustrated. And something that's perhaps controversial in this slab area, slab on ground group, would be whether or not we to use a vapor retarder. Um, in this instance, we did. And that goes against some of what was presented in part one of the slab series. And the reason for that was um, we knew that the other areas of the existing slab did have a vapor barrier. and I wanted to be consistent with what was there in maintaining that. Um, and the second area was this store did not have much storage space. And so they had some racks, they had pallets, but they did have things stored in a lot of different places. And sometimes when you have um, cardboard boxes or things stored directly against the slab surface, um, it can actually form as its own localized vapor, bar vapor barrier and cause uh, moisture in that area. So given those. Um, potentials, we included the vapor retarder in our design, um, but we made considerations to try to mitigate the potential for curling or excess shrinkage by increasing or limiting, we increased the number of joints and limited the panel size. Um, so previously in this area there were four panels and we broke that up into basically 16 panels uh, to limit that panel size and limit the potential for curling. Um, Similar to the detail clip uh, Kip showed, where we had the new to existing, we utilized the square dowels. Um, that's similar to the detail that, that Kip illustrated previously. Where we had new to new slabs, basically between phases, we used something a little different than the dowel baskets uh, Kip illustrated. Um, we used a pocket former with what's called a diamond plate. So on one side, in the form for the slab, they, they mount a pocket former that basically forms a sleeve so that then when they pour the other slab, they can insert a diamond plate of steel into that pocket and it forms, again, a, a split connection between the two slabs where it can accommodate horizontal movement but limit vertical displacement. Around the existing mezzanine column, we utilized a similar square dowel and this illustrates where we left portions of the existing slab as a footing for that column. photos here are during the work. Um, on the photo on the left, you can kind of see with a orange chalk line where they're starting to lay out around portions of the slab that are going to remain at the mezzanine column. The photo on the right here is where they've cut it out and left portions of the existing slab. The photo on the left here shows our square dowels between the new to the existing and then along the right side, the pocket former, basically the slab new to new joint that's going to occur between adjacent phases. And the photo on the right here is in the large area of the receiving where the vapor retarder is being laid. The, some of the considerations we made due to the cause of the initial failure with the weak layer of the top surface of the slab is we wanted to make sure that the curing and the finishing of the slab that we specified was, was well addressed since that seemed to be mistakes during that phase led to the failure that cause that weak layer to, uh, in the first place. And so in our specifications, we include a requirement that the contractor have on-site an ACI certified finisher. Um, in ACI 302, they specify different levels of trowel finishing uh, based on the use of the facility um, and the expected kind of exposure from vehicle or foot traffic. In our instance, we specified a normal trowel finish. On the next slide, I'll, I'll show that table and talk a little bit more about that. Um, we wanted saw cutting of the joints done within two hours of the final finish. Uh, we specified a seven-day moisture cure. Two days after the cure, um, we installed a hardener and densifier, uh, which is a liquid uh, silicate. 
material. Basically, it reacts with the calcium hydroxide and the concrete to kind of fill and densify those areas at the top surface of the slab. Uh, and so that has to be applied after hydration of concrete so that that calcium hydroxide already is existing. Um, we, in order due to the scheduling and working with the facility, we the longest we could wait to delay joint filling was only 14 days. That's not ideal considering that more shrinks to the slab would be expected, but we advise the client to have those refills at a later date. Uh, this is the table I mentioned from ACI 302, which kind of gets a little bit more specific on the types of finishing for slabs. Um, I spoke with Doug Denno earlier this week because I couldn't really find a great definition between what was between a light steel trowel finish, a normal steel trowel finish, or a hard steel trowel finish. And he and I talked about that and what our, I guess, opinion of that would be. So a light steel trowel finish would be considered basically one pass of finishing. A normal would be two passes, and a hard would be three passes of trowel finishing, and perhaps with each subsequent phase, uh, more pressure or smaller trowel being applied to further densify that surface. And here is a photo of the completed receiving area slab. The products we used on this, um, again, the Stego Wrap Vapor Retarder. Um, we did use the polyurea joint filler. Um, that was in the specification that they kind of asked us to fall in line with. While we used it, I wasn't made aware of issues with the polyurea. Um, I did use the polyurea on a project on Hilton, in Hilton Head Island on some slab repairs there. And we did have issues with the air voids that Kit mentioned. Um, in that instance, the air voids that I had seen were a little bit larger. Um, I think on that case also, they when they shaved the joint, it was slightly concave rather than perfectly flush with the epoxy. So since then, uh, I have gone to using the epoxy instead of the polyurea. The penetrating harder and dense fire was a euclid chemical product, and then the dowels were a PNA construction technology product. So in summary, I guess for our presentation, um, with slab on ground repairs in our experiences, there can be multiple causes for deterioration, um, whether that's from, as Kit mentioned, impact or fatigue or concrete materials issues. And that really identifying durable repairs, which is where WJ can bring value, is very similar to probably how we approach other projects. And that's with a, trying to get a correct diagnosis of what the deterioration is. And that's kind of what we call the science of, of this. And then trying to then look at the repairs that we can do and how to apply them to those varying conditions. This gets into the part of the art of the repair. And lastly, uh, just in my experience, just from trying to do mock-ups or as much as we can be involved during the construction period to look at the quality control aspects and get on board with the contractor and have that dialogue leads to success as well. And it looks like we have a few questions. Okay, the first one is for Kip. For a spall repair, should the edges of the patch be angled into the lock in, in the patch? And obviously, that's not going to hurt. But the way that we've showed them where we didn't do that, uh, we haven't, I, I've never had, really had an issue with that. So um, I, I guess it doesn't hurt, but you don't need to do that. I've had good success using the methods that we showed in, our, in, our, in, our, in the photos that we showed. And uh, I don't know how hard that is to do. I mean, it might be worth it if that's a simple matter of changing the angle on your saw. It's no big deal. Um, but if it turns into a headache, I probably wouldn't probably wouldn't do it because it uh, probably doesn't, and the cost benefit of it doesn't pencil out. This is Darren. When when I've specified that repair, typically I think in our execution part, we'll say that they would do a parallel saw cut first, and then they would do intermediate perpendicular cuts, and it might be hard to remove that angled part without damaging the, the upper part, given that we're only going so shallow. Uh, like if they're, they'd make those saw cuts, but obviously they can't, oh, they don't want them to overcut to the parallel saw cut. And so it might be, given the small dimensions we're working with, it just might be too much to ask. Yeah, that's probably a good answer. Basically difficult to achieve in practice. 
but theoretically I have no issue with it. Okay, thanks, Kip. There's another question here. Um, is there any value to using a reinforced fluid applied membrane for widespread crack repair? A reinforced fluid applied membrane? Um, yes. Again, it goes back to what you're trying to achieve. Uh, if you could, if, you know, it, that, that's kind of a broad categorization, but if you if it's capable of bridging the cracks and accommodating slight movement uh, and, you know, under heavy demand situations, sure. But I doubt, again, in practice, that that's ever going to really pencil out, you know, membrane, like a reinforced membrane. You know, I'm dealing with, typically I'm dealing with warehouses that can be like 500,000 square feet. And so something like that at, you know, 10 bucks a square foot uh, to actually get something that's effective is probably not going to pencil out. So again, theoretically that could work, but in practice, I don't, I don't think, uh, at least in an industrial situation, especially if you don't need waterproofing or anything like that, I, I don't think that's uh, a real value. There's a, I don't think there's a lot of value in that. Okay, and one last question. Uh, what is the difference between Goop and Goop Plus? <laughs> um, is that what I said? <laughs> I, goop is a catch-all term for just any sort of material that's been poured in there without much thought given to what they're trying to achieve with that material. So, for example, we use a semi-rigid epoxy material into the into the into the crack, and uh, there's a reason I shared with you why we use that specific semi-rigid material, and. Uh, Goop Plus was, was maybe, I would say, just having some minor surface prep. So Goop is just Goop. No surface prep, no nothing, no cleaning, nothing. Just come in and pour it in. And that's really all I meant. Is, yeah, it looks like somebody made a little bit of an effort to prepare the surface, but still not, not quite there. Okay, and I think that's all the questions that we have. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for attending.